Good, uh, good day, everyone. Good morning, actually, because usually after lunch, everybody feels sleepy, you know. And the fact that we had to start 10, 10 minutes later than the schedule actually made me happy because, you know, you guys had time to come into the room and get yourself some seats as far away from me as possible for some of you. Others, I see they're a bit brave. All right. Um, anyway, let's... Uh, Let's cut through everything and, uh, and get started with this session. It will be go it's going to be a session about traditional cybercrime. Um, thank you for joining, honestly. And uh, my name is Stefan Tanase. I'm a um, senior security researcher for Kaspersky Lab. Here are a couple of uh, words about myself. Uh, the first thing you need to know about myself is that I'm not a Russian, even though I look like a Russian. I mean, if you've never seen a Russian before, this is how a Russian looks like. That's what everybody tells me. And, um, Whenever I go to Moscow, if I want to visit a museum or anything like that, I usually get in for free because everyone just assumes that I'm a Russian. But I'm not. So I'm actually from Romania, from Bucharest. And I know that you guys, uh, along with other you know, Western European countries, have had problems with Romanians in the past years or so. But uh, I'm one of the good guys. And I'm actually happy to, uh, to be here for this session. So I work as a senior security researcher for Kaspersky Lab. I joined the company in, uh, in 2007, almost five years ago. And I remember when I joined, um, I was employee number 700 and something. We were 700 people in this company. And right now, we're almost close to 2,500. So we've witnessed a huge, huge growth in the past uh, couple of years or so. I'm not saying it's because of me, but, uh, you know, uh, not only because of me. So I work in this team called the Global Research and Analysis Team, which is a team of 30 people spread out all over the world, um, most of them senior security researchers with uh, a lot of experience. I can say I'm learning a lot of things from them, and I can also say that I can uh, teach them a lot of things at the same time. Uh, we've actually got a guy in the UK as well, David Am. Maybe you guys uh, know him from, uh, from other conferences. But yeah, I have a special interest in web security, web-based threats, generally new malware. Malware that spreads over the web, because the web, as you guys know it, it's the number one infection vector nowadays. And um, I joined the company with a background in web development. I used to do a lot of web development be before joining uh, Kaspersky Lab. So um, when I joined, you know, I got involved in many interesting research projects like developing honeypots, working with uh, huge databases of malware, uh, doing distributed computing projects, and uh, generally, you know, artificial intelligence-like systems that can basically automate the, uh, the tasks that we do every day around here. And uh, one of the things that I'm also doing is speaking at conferences, such as uh, this one, and I'm very happy to be here today with you. So. That's uh, almost everything that you guys need to know about myself. Um, and let's jump right in. And I have a question for you. Have you been following the news lately? And uh, no, I'm not actually going to uh, expect an answer because it's an obvious question. You're at the security conference, so it's obviously you're following the security news. But if you've been um, uh, looking at the whole, let's say, security news picture, you can see that mostly everyone is talking about cyber war nowadays, and it seems to me that we're forgetting to uh, talk about cyber crime. Because cyber crime is, uh, is still there, you know, and um, everyone's talking cyber war, as I, told, as I told you. I think this is a problem, and I'll show, you, uh, I'll show you why during this presentation. Now, in order to make sure that everyone is uh, fully awake, I'd like to um, start with a quiz, a very simple quiz in which you'll uh, learn a little bit about malware history. And the question is simple, what virus displays the following message after successfully encrypting 50% of your hard drive? And we have four variants here. We have A, Melissa, we have B, Denzuk, we have C, one half, and D, 50 cent. Which one do you think it is? It's Melissa, right? It's, uh, it's a little bit older than Melissa, so give it another try. And uh, believe me, the name is pretty self-explanatory. And it's not 50 cent. <laughs> right. This is called, um, it's called one half. And one half was actually one of the first uh, pieces of malware, uh, actually the first one, from a family that we nowadays call ransomware. And what is ransomware? Ransomware is basically malware which, when it infects your computer, it will go through all of your files and choose the most important ones, usually documents, emails, and things like that and we'll encrypt them. In this case, and this is GP code, it's a new, modern version of uh, ransomware. 
Uh, it usually would encrypt it with like very strong algorithms, such as RSA, and um, it will ask you for some ransom money if you want to get your data back. You can see in this specific example, the uh, author asks for a $125 payment via Ucash or PSC, that's a PaySafe card. These are two types of prepaid cards, so basically anonymous payments. You know, you get the card from any shop and you, you get a number and then you, you send it to the author and he can cash it in. Uh, of course, if you look at the English being used here, you can figure out that the authors are not British. Um, but yeah, this, these are actually real threats. And this is, why am I showing you all this? Is because this is a very classic example of how cyber criminals are making money nowadays. They're basically, and this is, in this example, they're making money by stealing it directly from the user, right? Encrypting his data and then asking for some ransom money. And actually, that's actually one of the biggest, um, one of the big parts of, uh, of cyber crime. Cyber criminals making, stealing money directly from the users. They can do it by uh, ransomware, as I showed you, or they can do it by uh, intercepting their online banking transactions, intercept, intercepting their um, e-payments, like their credit card numbers, uh, electronic currency, so on and so forth. And the question I usually get asked, especially from uh, younger people, is uh, what if I don't have any money on my computer? You know, what if I don't deal with money on my computer? And the answer is pretty simple. Then your computer is still valuable, actually very valuable to cyber criminals for a very, very simple reason. As long as your computer will have a CPU, some memory, and most importantly, internet bandwidth, cyber criminals will be able to use that computer's resources to provide services to other cyber criminals. We call this market the C2C market. We have the B2B, the business to business, business market, B2C, business to customer. We call it C2C, as in cyber criminal to cyber criminal. And these are usually those uh, malwares that uh, you see sending spam or launching DDoS attacks or doing pay-per-click fraud, basically trying to get to squeeze money out of that infection, to monetize that infection uh, without stealing money directly from the user. Because guess what? Most of the times, the users actually don't deal with money on their computers. So that's the two main ways through which cyber criminals generate revenue from uh, infecting computers. Now, maybe some of you were wondering what's up with that huge sigma sign on the right side of the screen. It's actually not a huge sigma sign, it's a huge M, and it's a huge M which stands for malware. And it's so huge because malware itself is very huge nowadays. And um, in order for you to um, realize how huge malware is, I'm not going to show you charts or anything like that, uh, but I'm going to ask you to come back to one half. And as you maybe noticed in the screenshot, one half is not a very new virus, you know. It was running in, in DOS. And um, the year when one half, one half appeared was 1994. And 1994 was a year when we can roughly say that we've had one new virus appearing every hour. So every day, basically, a couple of dozens of, uh, of new viruses. Pretty simple, to, pretty simple to process and pretty simple to uh, analyze, right? Moving forward. 2006, we're in a situation when we see one new virus appearing every minute. And moving even forward, closer to the present, 2011, last year, we've seen one new virus appearing every second. That's basically, um, that basically translates to um, 70,000 new malicious software samples processed every day by Kaspersky Lab. So that's why we need to do a lot of automation. That's why we need to do a lot of uh, you know, artificial intelligence systems that can um, that can process all the malware without input from, uh, from human analysts like ourselves. But you might be asking yourself, what's up with 2011, uh, with 2012, with this year? And with this year, first of all, is the year when one half turns 18, right? Uh, 18 years have passed since the first variant of one half. And why is this important? Because, you know, who cares about one half anymore? It doesn't, it can't even infect the computers that we use nowadays. And the answer is very simple. 18, the age of 18, is the age of consent in most countries out there. It's the age where you can drink and is the age where you can legally drive. Of course, not at the same time, but you, know, you can do it because you're an adult now. You're not a kid anymore and you have responsibility. And basically it means that you're mature. So 18 is the year when uh, people normally reach maturity. And when talking about cybercrime, in my opinion, 2012 is the year when cybercrime reaches maturity. And for the moment, I'm just going to ask you to remember that little phrase over there, cybercrime reaches maturity, and we'll get back to it later on in the, in the talk, and I'm going to show you what I mean about it exactly. 
But let's get back to malware, because I told you that malware is, um, is very big nowadays, right? And um, I'm going to show you why it's so big. It's, um, it's actually very simple, because malware nowadays just has one purpose, you know? It's not the days when people were creating viruses just for fun, you know, and you would see the little ISG ambulance going through your screen whenever you get infected. We don't get to see that stuff anymore. Malware nowadays has just one purpose, and that purpose is to generate revenue for their um, authors. They're running their businesses like real-life businesses. And of course, those, um, that money gets reinvested. And you know, it usually, I mean, it gets spent, first of all, on nice cars and girls and parties and everything. But what's left, and usually there is something left, usually gets reinvested into what we call innovation, just like normal companies innovate, Cyber criminal operations, they also like to innovate and to discover new ways in which they can get their uh, malware on, running onto our computers. So money gets reinvested into innovation, which itself generates more malware, as you could have guessed. So you can see how this is going on and on like, um, like a vicious circle. And actually, I want to show you a couple of examples from, um, from 2011, examples in which um, Cyber criminals have innovated, have generated revenue, and basically have generated more malware that can infect our computers. And the first example is uh, the fake antivirus businesses, because the fake antivirus business witnessed a huge boom in 2010 and 2011, uh, in 2010 actually. And 2011 was the year when we saw the fake AV business stabilizing. It's not, um, you know, it's not gone away. There are still people who are falling for these tricks but um, mostly it's not at the levels at which it used to be. It's like basically at 20% of the, of the level uh, in 2010. Um, and 10. So yeah, fake antivirus, it was a huge, uh, you know, it was a huge innovation from, uh, from the cyber criminal side because they were able to, to get money by, um, let's say, mimicking the business models of uh, real antivirus companies, but without, you know, without providing any type, of, uh, any type of protection. It was just a scam. And, while some areas of cybercrime are going down, others are, of course, going up because cybercrime itself is going uh, up as a whole. So 2011 was the year when we've seen the first IRC bot and the first Zeus variant for Android mobile phones. And actually, 2011, and again, I'm not going to sh bore you with any, with any charts here, but 2011 was clearly the year of uh, mobile malware because just in December 2011, we've processed more mobile malware variants than in all the previous years since 2004. So we've, mobile malware has witnessed a huge, huge growth. And the reason is basically pretty simple, you know. Up until uh, now, basically, there was no operating system which you could say is uh, dominant on the market, you know. But now with the Android phones, which mostly everybody uses, it's very easy for cyber criminals to create malware and to, to make sure that malware is going to run on all these, uh, all these systems. So um, what about the PCs? And I'm sure that some of you might have heard of TDSS, which is the most sophisticated rootkit out there right now. And 2011 was the moment when TDSS started mining bitcoins. I mean, this is, you know, it's a very, very sophisticated rootkit which infected hundreds of thousands of computers all over the world. And at one point, the authors decided it would be a very nice monetization tactic to start mining bitcoins. Now, for those of you who don't know what bitcoin is, uh, bitcoins are basically a virtual currency, but it's a cryptographic currency. So in order to generate it, you must use computing power to solve very complicated mathematical equations and thus generate those bitcoins. So you can imagine with a huge botnet of hundreds of thousands of computers, uh, you can get quite a lot of revenue. Uh, the most important thing being that Bitcoin is fully anonymous. It's fully, uh, you know, the transactions are, uh, are basically private over there. So that's how, you know, that's how they, they make money. They can make money directly or they can make they can make money indirectly, as I showed you. Um, and they make a lot of money. This is actually, uh, these are actually two screenshots from a mobile malware investigation that we did last year, which was showing um, how much money a gang that was distributing uh, an SMS Trojan was making. And you can see the amounts are pretty stagger staggering. $2,000 in five days, $5,000 in five days. That's a working week. I hope you guys learn more than that, you know, but most of the people, they can't earn that much, you know, doing legal things. But yeah, mobile malware 
quite a huge growth. And they usually make the money by, um, uh, sorry, I'm going to show you a bit, a bit later how they make the money. But yeah, that's the thing with mobile malware. If we look at PC malware, uh, pay-per-click is, um, is a very famous way of uh, indirect monetization. So not stealing directly from the user, but using the user, user's resources to generate revenue. And um, this is actually a screenshot from a Russian affiliate network that pays money for every click that the, um, well, victims actually make on those, on those links. And you can see that the top five webmasters are easily earning more than $1,000 on a daily basis through pay-per-click advertising. So again, quite a lot of money. And um, of course, when you make a lot of money, you start investing into innovation, as I, as I told you earlier. And 2011 was the year when Bitcoin mining went peer to peer. Now, why is this important? Why is this relevant? Because usually malware connects to a central command and control server. And of course, that central command and control server can be easily shut down, disconnected by the internet, by authorities, of course, working together with security researchers. So um, in theory, it's fairly easy to shut down a botnet if you just cut out the command and control server from the, uh, from the internet. That's where peer-to-peer -peer comes in. And when we're, dealing, when we're dealing with a peer-to-peer -peer botnet, which basically gets, it com gets its commands from other peers in the network, from other infected machines in the network, it's almost close to impossible to shut down. If you want to shut down something like this, you basically need to go to each and every computer in the network and disinfect it which, of course, is uh, almost close to impossible. But yeah, this is uh, one example of how they innovate. And it's actually an example of innovation on the technical side, because you know, they're not using the central CNC anymore. They're using peer-to-peer -peer command and control infrastructure. But while innovations on, um, on the technical side might be interesting, they also innovate on the, let's say, human side of things, on the social engineering side of things. And 2011 was the year when we saw the first fake antivirus softwares with uh, using the Kaspersky scheme, actually, you know, profiting from our um, our designs, our logos, and everything, exploiting the trust that users have in us in order to distribute their um, their malicious creations. So that, yeah, that's how they uh, that's how they innovate. Talking about mobile, 2011 was the year when we first saw successful malicious QR codes being used to actively infect visitors of a couple of uh, Russian websites. And they were actually distributing mobile malware through the QR code, making it much easier for, uh, for users to get infected. You know, they don't have to download, type up URLs on their mobile phones. They can just take a picture. And you can imagine the implications of these attacks whenever you ride the subway, for example, and you see so many QR codes, um, so many QR codes over there. It's so easy for anyone to just, you know, stick a different QR code on top of a QR code that's on an advertisement, and then people would just blindly scan it and open it with, um, with their mobile phones. And you've seen me talking about mobile malware quite a lot, and maybe you're asking yourself, how do cyber criminals make money through mobile malware? And the most common way is uh, SMS Trojans. These are basically Trojans that once they get onto your phone, they will start sending SMS messages from time to time to premium rate numbers. Now, why is this interesting? It's interesting because up until 2011, because SMS Trojans were not invented in 2011. But up until 2011, it was a very localized problem. It was just a problem in countries like Russia or a couple of uh, Southeast Asian countries. Usually, where it would be, a, because of a mix of legislation, it would be very easy for cyber criminal gangs to get their hands onto these short numbers with, um, uh, with premium rates, basically, on them. And 2011 was the year when we saw criminals starting uh, distributing SMS Trojans that had embedded inside numbers, short numbers for premium payments for basically almost all countries in, uh, in the world, you know, starting from United States and Canada to almost every, every European country that's out there. So it's not a local threat anymore, it's becoming a global threat. So that's how they innovate, that's how they make money, and that's how they generate malware. And this is basically the vicious circle I was, I was telling you about, the one that's really, really hard to stop. And um, now, for the, uh, let's say, interesting part, or at least my favorite part of the talk, which is the fact that cybercrime reaches maturity. And that, this is actually the tagline that you need to take out of this entire presentation. Cybercrime reaches 
maturity. And I promised you that I'm going to show you what exactly do I mean about that. So we're in 2012 right now. In 2012, except for being the year when one half turns 18, it's a year in which we can say that there are more cyber criminals than ever who have been um, running businesses for more than 10 years. So basically, there are more cyber criminals than ever who can say that, hey, I have plus 10 years of experience doing this. There are more cyber criminals than ever who, for the past 10 years, have been running these businesses profitably. So they can say, hey, for plus 10 years, I've been making, making really good profits. Now, of course, those profits get, re get reinvested, as I showed you earlier. But the reality is that we're starting to see exit strategies appearing in their businesses. Now, what do I mean about this? I'm talking about, let's say, cyber criminal gang that invests half a million dollars into a club or a bar or a pub or whatever. Generally, real life businesses, legal businesses, uh, which at one point can turn into actual exit strategies. And let me give you a couple of examples. Now, this is the part with the pictures, the part which everyone enjoys the most. So if you've been sleeping, please um, wake up right now and tell me if you can recognize this very nice house. Anyone? Not really, yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely bigger than the apartments that I've seen around here. But um, in case you don't recognize it, I'm going to give you a hint. This guy lives over there. Yeah, he's guilty for that. Um, He's the founder of uh, MegaUpload.com. I'm sure you might have heard of him. He was arrested earlier this year. Now he's, uh, he was released on bail last week, I think. Um, but yeah, I'm talking here about Kim.com, Kim Schmitz, Kimball, Kim Tim Vester. You might know him by a lot of names. And um, it's actually a pretty interesting guy. You know, he's, uh, he's definitely living the life. He's actually larger than life. At least that's his personal motto, let's say, his personal uh, tagline. But, well, many people know that he was arrested at the beginning of the year for piracy, basically. Many people don't know that this is actually the third time he got arrested. And this guy has a long, um, let's say, career, both with uh, police and both with uh, internet businesses. Because in 1998, he was arrested for the first time for trading and, check this out, calling card numbers, which he acquired for hacker, from hackers in the United States. Now, probably, you know, credit cards and online shopping were definitely not that popular back then. But this guy was selling calling card numbers in 1998. So basically, he started his career doing things that now cyber criminals are doing, you know, trading stolen, card, uh, stolen, stolen credit cards, right, from your computers. So <clears throat> in my opinion, he started his career as a cyber criminal. Now, Fast forward to the present days. Kim.com was making $50 million per year when what happened? Yep, he got arrested. So it's, um, it's a good story, right? The bad guy gets arrested. It's a story with, uh, uh, with a happy ending, right? It's, uh, it's a very nice story. But let's move on to some other guys which are more, uh, let's say, dear to me than, um, than Kim.com. And if some of you might have recognized Kim.com when you saw the picture of him, I'm sure that you can't recognize this guy. Although, I'm sure you can recognize what's on the desk behind him, and I'm not talking about the computer screen, right? Um, this is actually a friend of his. Also seems to enjoy uh, the money, but he's more outdoorsy. You know, he likes holidays, and he likes expensive, expensive cars, and uh, seaside resorts, and things like that. Um, also a friend of theirs. This was actually the, uh, the head of the gang the technical head of the gang. Um, I'm sure you don't recognize them, but I can tell you how much money these guys were making. And they were making $1.7 million in just nine months. How do we know this? I'm talking here about the, um, the Coopface gang. And if you haven't heard of Coopface, long story short, Coopface is basically the first web 2. Dot worm. It's the first worm that used social networking websites to spread itself from one profile to the other. So if you ever received messages from your Facebook friends with, hey, check out this uh, video of me, and when you would click the link, it would take you to a page with, which would used to look like YouTube, a page would, which would actually ask you to download some sort of codec if you wanted to see that specific video. It was most likely these guys, the Coopface gang. And um, 
how do we know all the pictures? How do we know exactly how much money they're making? Well, it's a very long and very interesting story. Uh, and I'll tell you a couple of juicy details from it because I was part of the Kubeface working group on behalf of Kaspersky Lab. And um, the Kubeface working group was basically a group comprised of law enforcement and, uh, and security researchers over the world uh, with just one purpose in mind, to try to stop Kubeface. And not very long after the working group was formed, uh, we managed to get access on an image of a server which was used by these guys as a command and control server. And on that command and control server, they had a fully fledged accounting system which would connect to every affiliate network that they were using to monetize their infections and report back the amount of money that they made on that specific day using that specific affiliate network. And all, all the amounts of money would then be added up in this accounting system. So that's how we were able to pinpoint exactly how much money they made you know, every single day. Now, what was even more interesting than this was that these guys were very, very greedy. They actually had a script set up on that server in such a way so that every morning they would receive an SMS message on their mobile phone numbers telling them how much money they made the day before. How cool is that, right? So you can see actually uh, they had it set up in such a way so that they were able to choose the exact time of the day when they would like to receive the message for every every day of the week, so you can see how some of them are waking up at 9 or 10, while some others are waking up at 12. So it's uh, definitely a nice, um, a nice way of life. And, um, you know, they were making quite a lot of money, more than $2 million every year. When what happened? Well, they weren't arrested, but information about them got disclosed. Now, if you haven't been really following the coup face news, what happened uh, in the beginning of this year? Facebook decided to finally release publicly release all the information about the, uh, the people behind it. Now, the, uh, let's say the closed and vetted trusted security, uh, security industry, the Kubeface Working Group, we were aware of, the f of who these people are together with Facebook, because Facebook was also part of the, the working group. And the working group made sure to share all the relevant details, both to authorities in the United States and both to authorities in Russia. But more than two years have passed and nothing happened. You know, these guys were still there. These guys were still making millions of dollars. And uh, we, knew, we knew, we basically knew everything about them, you know. We had pictures of them, names, phone numbers. We even had the GPS coordinates of their office, which was based in St. Petersburg. Because we, we don't really know why they did that, but when we got access to that server image, that command and control server, uh, in one folder we could find a picture of them in the office, and the picture was taken with an iPhone. And guess what? The GPS module on that iPhone was activated, so in the EXIF data of the JPEG file, we were able to see the exact coordinates of where their office was. And this was happening two years ago, and nothing happened on the law enforcement side. So, you know, is it a good story? Is it a bad story? I'd say both ways, because, you know, bad guys, they didn't get arrested, but still, they stopped doing what they did. Because you can imagine that after Facebook published all the data about them, these guys went crazy and they started deleting all their social networking profiles. They started shutting down all of their command and control servers. And basically, you know, I don't know where they are, but if I were them, I wouldn't be in Russia anymore, you know, because everybody now knows who they are. And they're still free, they're still out there. So we still hope that these guys are going to get arrested, but for the time being, they're free and they're out there and they can probably enjoy the money which they've earned and probably they can spend it to buy their freedom or whatever is possible in, um, in Russia, right? Now, if some of you recognize Kim.com, mostly no one recognized the Coopface gang, I'm 100% sure that nobody here except myself is going to recognize this website. Now, this website is called Vplay. And currently, it's, um, it's one of the top 10 websites in Romania. It's a very nice website. You, know, you can actually, you, you can literally watch every episode of every season of every TV show that was ever created in the world. You know? uh, they're all categorized. They all have really nice uh, subtitles. They even have subtitles which are better than the subtitles that we get on TV, which is, um, which is pretty cool. So that's how the website became really popular. Now, what's the catch, you might ask? Of course, it's not a legal website. It's, um, they basically get their content from, um, uh, from public sources, from torrents mostly, 
and uh, of course they don't pay any royalties to the uh, copyright owners of these, um, of these creations. So based on the traffic data and based on how many views each episode has and how many comments are posted to each episode, which usually, you know, when talking about shows like the Big Bang Theory, for example, or Two and a Half Men, you'd usually have thousands of comments being posted at every episode. We're easily estimating that these guys were making around half a million dollars per year through SMS payments. When, guess what happened? They didn't get arrested, they didn't get disclosed, they just decided to stop. Well, they didn't stop the website. Uh, the website is still there, but they moved the server. The server is not in Romania anymore. Also, they stopped uh, charging money um, for viewing these things. So basically, in my opinion, I think they just left the website out there. But they went away. They're not uh, you know, actively taking care of the website anymore. Now. What does this mean for us and how does this change what we do? Because I told you these three stories, the story about Kim.com, the story about Coopface, and the story about vPlay for a reason, which is, you have to ask yourself a very simple question, which is, what do all cyber criminals that were caught have in common? And the answer is uh, not that hard to guess. They usually went too far for too long, right? And I'm asking myself, what if Kim.com or the Coopface gang would have stopped before getting caught. And that's exactly what vPlay did. That's, uh, you know, they decided to stop before getting caught. And in my opinion, probably vPlay will never have to pay consequences, to pay for the consequences for the facts that they, um, that they did. You know, they will never have to face legal consequences for that. So the conclusion here is that as a cyber criminal, the longer you stay in business, the um, bigger the chance of you getting caught. So what we're seeing is cyber criminals, which are basically creating and implementing exit strategies. We know for sure that the Coopface gang have bought a club in St. Petersburg. Uh, they were always posting pictures from them there. They're mostly uh, all of the time spending time over there. So that was a real exit strategy for them. They were still doing the cyber crime stuff, of course, because it would probably earn them much more money than the club. But the club was there. So. What we're seeing is cyber criminals implementing exit strategies. Some of them are forced to do so. Some, some of them choose to do so by themselves. But the idea here is that if they don't get caught uh, before they quit, they will most likely never get caught. And that's, I think, a very interesting thing. Now, a couple of, um, a couple of conclusions. The main idea of this presentation is that cybercrime reaches maturity. That was the main message that I wanted to, to send you. And uh, this basically means that they're both optimizing and consolidating their businesses, uh, both from a financial perspective, a technical perspective, but also from a legal perspective. We're starting to see cybercrime actors retiring from what they do. Uh, many of them doing it before they actually get caught. Some of them, of course, like the Coopface gang, they were forced to retire, but that's the exception. That's not the, the rule of the game, usually. So what I think we need is uh, faster investigations here, because you know everyone knew who these people were ever since more than two years ago, but nothing happened. So the law enforcement processes are very, very slow, especially for uh, a world which is changing as fast as the internet is doing nowadays. So we basically need faster investigations, and this can only be achieved through collaboration. And of course, we need better cybercrime laws, laws that can allow us to act quicker and, of course, not cause any problems to Internet citizens' privacy level, because uh, that's a very sensitive topic right now. So I'm not, uh, I'm not supporting privacy invasion or anything like that, but I just think we need really good laws that can help us fight cybercrime, because in most of the countries, cybercrime is being dealt with with laws which are 20 years, if you're lucky, 20 years old. In Brazil, for example, our colleague from Brazil was telling us that uh, the laws which they're using to prosecute cyber criminals are from the 50s. So that's, uh, that's insane, right? And you know, I usually ask myself, maybe it's time to start rebuilding the internet from scratch because the way the internet is right now, it definitely, uh, definitely wasn't created with the idea that people will do bad things on it. So we probably need to change that, but it's, uh, uh, of course, it's more like an utopia. It's not a real thing. Main idea is that cybercrime can't be ignored. And if you remember in the beginning of the presentation, 
I was telling you about cyber war and the fact that people seem to talk more about cyber war right now and not about cyber crime. And I'm going to show you why cyber crime can't be ignored. And it's a very, very simple point and it will be the last point I'm trying to make here. Now, think of the fact that an average botnet has tens of thousands of computers in it which are controlled by a guy somewhere in China or Russia or whatever. Um, you can imagine that there's a huge amount of information being stored on those machines. And these botnets are mostly used in traditional cybercrime operations, you know, like launching DDoS attacks or sending spam or, uh, I don't know, intercepting credit card numbers. So most of them stay under the radar. But what most people don't seem to realize is that every piece of malware that's out there today has some sort of, let's say, updating mechanism through which a new variant can be pushed to the users. So if a computer, which is right now infected with a Trojan that just sends spam emails, uh, that computer, that, that, that spam spending, uh, sending Trojan can basically be changed at any moment with just a click of a button into a Trojan that's meant to spy on that user's activity or to, uh, you know, modify his documents or to spy on his, his, um, his activities at his company or where he's working. So the main idea is that cybercrime can be turned into cyber war with just the click of the button. And that's why I think that cybercrime shouldn't really be ignored. So thank you very much for uh, paying attention. And uh, that's my contact data. If you guys have any questions or anything, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, thank you very much once again.